Good evening. I'm Gordon Pinsent. Next week is Halloween, dress-up time. Somehow it seems appropriate that the flamboyant female impersonator, Craig Russell, died on Halloween night, 1990. It was always the one night of the year that he didn't dress up. He said it was a chance for everyone else to see what it was like. Every other night, though, Craig Russell was in full drag queen glory. Sometimes he was Peggy Lee, Barbara Streisand, Judy Garland, Bette Midler. His masquerades and outrageous style became acceptable to middle-class North America, and he played to sold-out audiences. But tonight, in the last recorded interview, he talks about the cost of that fame. Hello, Miss West. This is Craig. Oh, Craig. Oh, hello, Craig. I feel like a million tonight, one at a time. <laughs> well, who am I now? Hello, Jolly's. Well, hello, Jolly's. So nice to be back home where I belong. In researching their lives, I think I've neglected my own a little bit, you know, but uh, you can't have everything. You're looking swell, Jolly's. I can tell. Jollies, you're still growing, you're still growing. Russell Craig Eady was born on January 10th, 1948, and adopted by Norma Hall Eady and Russell Eady. Always we sang. I mean, from when he was little, we listened to records a lot. Uh, his first singing, actually, was when he was living in Port Perry with my mother for a year. Um, he started singing in the choir at the church. And then he was only, what, nine? And then when we came back to Toronto, he sang in the St. James Cathedral Choir, Boys Choir, for a year there. But it was just too tying down for him. I mean, he wasn't into choir singing. He wanted something a little bit more lively, I think. So you can have a frog in my throat. He used to be a prince. And he could change, and he had that, seemed to have that long voice range, that he could change it, even in his speaking voice, as well as his singing voice. He could go, you know, from high down to Arm, Louis Armstrong or whatever it is. He could do that same thing with his talking voice. Hello, Dolly. Hello, Dolly. Wow, wow, wow. If we would have company of an evening, after they'd go home, he could, he could, repeat everything they said. He could do all their actions. He could get their voices. And he would only be little. He'd only be seven or eight, maybe. But he, he, could, he could just take, take them off. I mean, he'd have his in stitches. I've never known anyone worth knowing who wasn't a positive fruitcake. Come Christmas time, Christmas is always big in our family. And uh, for something different for Craig, uh, my mother, his grandmother, decided she'd put earrings in his, in his Christmas stocking. And, that was really the highlight of his whole Christmas that year, was to get these earrings, especially from grandmother. So, wow, Santa's a camp. She figured I had emerald eyes, so I might as well have emerald earrings. <laughs> Craig's early exploration of his feminine side offended his ex-Navy insurance salesman father, widely regarded as a man's man. Uh, Russell uh, didn't, um, didn't approve of Craig, didn't approve of Craig's actions, even as a young, uh, a young uh, five-year-old wanted to dress up as a lady, for example. Russ didn't approve of that. My uh, father really didn't, we didn't get along. He just didn't want a fag for a son, fairy, you know. That was one thing that Craig was really upset about all through his career, was that his dad would never accept it. Russell Eady's lack of acceptance was to be a critical factor in Craig's life, as was the divorce of his adoptive parents when he was nine. It's an upheaval that, uh, that made, as I say, made me want to find something I could hang on to for my whole life. So I somehow got into Mae West. I thought, this gal's around forever. He started um, watching late movies of the old movies. And that's how he got into Mae West and the fan club. It was uh, my oldest daughter, of course, went to school with Craig. And he would come home with her, particularly on a Saturday. He would come down on a Saturday, bringing all the things with him that had 
to do with the Mae West fan club, which he evolved. And Shirley was the secretary, treasurer, and the whole nine yards, and they would plan strategy in the living room while the rest of the family made sure they were somewhere else. And he actually wrote to Mae West and grandly told her that there was a fan club, and he was the president, and they were members. I just made up 25 names and forged a list. Said, we got a club for you, you know? <laughs> made up the minutes of the meeting, and I felt so guilty. And what are your New Year's resolutions? Well, <laughs> well, one of them is uh, I'm going to stay away from temptation as long as temptation stays away from me. <laughs> Well, I must sign off now. Oh, all right, there. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> Bye-bye. Goodbye. Bye-bye. What a woman. Now the story has no ball. Norma Hall Eady married Eric Hurst, a Toronto bus driver. Both supported Craig's obsession with Mae West. She invited him to come up and see him, see her sometime, that sort of thing. And so he, he worked, I got him a job and he worked all summer. And he took his money and he took the bus. I just wanted to meet her because I wanted to see what was the real, what she really looked like, what she really was like. So I went. Three days, three nights on the bus. It was worth it. I stayed four weeks. It was great, because her monkey bit me. She said, don't call your parents, you know? Don't tell them, it'll upset them. So she cut my food for me, and when it healed up, I came back. Then when he came home, this is when he became dissatisfied with school. Couldn't really settle. I think he was back for about six months. And uh, then he... I think she invited him to carry on and down there, be his, uh, her secretary. We drove him down, by the way. We drove him down to, and we stayed with her in her home in uh, Santa Monica. She let us stay out at her uh, house on the beach, and we had access to it. She used to come out every night for dinner. She'd bring the, the cook with her, or chef with her, and he'd make the dinner, and, and, uh, and We'd all sit around and talk, and then she would take us for a drive around, have the chauffeur drive us around and explain all her properties and stuff that she owned, and, and uh, she was really, really a nice person. She really was friendly with us. I couldn't resist. Went back and stayed for a time till I found out the intrigues around a star, the things they say. Everybody's trying to be number one in their life, and they all backstab each other, and... I was just had no experience with these barracudas and these piranhas, and it broke my heart, you know. One night, Craig phoned from L.A. hysterical. He was so hysterical over the phone, I had trouble making out what he was saying. Something very bad had happened at Mae West's house. Craig told his mother he returned to Canada to avoid the Vietnam draft. He told his later public he came back after being denounced by a jealous co-worker. He told his friend, roommate, and later lover, Margaret Gibson, another story. When he came to my apartment, he looked like a ghost of Craig Eady. And he told me that the chauffeur, who shall remain nameless, had raped him, and that Mae West had watched the two Mae May Mirror. Funny business, a woman's career. The things you drop on the way up so that you can get there faster. You forget you're going to need them again later on when you go back to being a woman. And in spite of what other careers we've had or wanted, that's one career all females have in common. Being a woman. Who wrote this shit? It's 
said I was the best game player they'd addition to the month. Norma advised Craig Eady to find a career. At Bruno's School of Hair Design, he met Helen Phillips, with whom, surprising many, he fathered a daughter, Allison. And Helen told me, you know, so I was surprised that she was pregnant by him. Um, and I was surprised that she was going to have the child. And, um, you know, I'm quite, quite delighted now, of course. I mean, she's a very sweet young lady with a son of her own. Margaret and Shirley and Phil and Craig were, you know, were a group. I mean, they were spending their weekends at the apartment and, you know, they were having their fun at that time. I met Craig, uh, oh, just a few months after I got out of a private psychiatric sanitarium way the hell and gone in the country. They saw themselves as outcasts. The socially terrified Margaret Gibson, the childhood pal Shirley Flavel, the high school friend Philip Buckley, and the irrepressible Craig Eady. So at that time, you did, well, I didn't really think of him as being gay. Well, Shirley is, and I think she knew, because Craig knew, and I wasn't sure. I never had so much fun in my life. Craig, Craig said, hang on, gang, I've got a party trick. And he went into the tiny bedroom, and about five minutes later, Craig doesn't come out, but Marilyn Monroe comes out in a feather boa. And we used to get together at weekends and listen to music and, uh, and drink and uh, play act. And um, uh, Craig would do uh, Margaret's makeup. He was the, uh, the, the kingpin, the queenpin, if you like. And he definitely uh, was a great motivator. We were skipping on the sidewalk and drinking the vodka, and Craig said, yelled out, the four musketeers, and that's what we were. And I think people that come from unhappy families and have unhappy childhoods reach out for another family other than their biological family, and we found one in the four of us. I did love him, and I wanted to stay in love. The moment I laid eyes on Craig walking to Shirley Flavel's room, I thought, I love him. Margaret Gibson, then a fledgling author, used her times with Craig, Shirley, and Philip as the basis of Making It, a short story in her first award-winning book, The Butterfly Ward. Making It became the basis for Craig's first film, Outrageous. We borrowed, should I say, a Christmas tree from Mount, from Mount Pleasant Cemetery. And um, lots of snow everywhere. It's very hilly, it's beautiful and they are walking this tree down Young Street between them. And a police car does a U-turn. And I don't know whether it was Shirley's inspiration. It was a passing taxi. Shirley hailed it, and the four of them, plus tree, disappeared into this. I was horrified when they tell me this. I'm saying, but why did you tell me you needed money for Christmas tree? I just don't see it. <laughs> Where are these children? What did they listen to? Craig's public debut in drag was a Halloween excursion as Tallulah Bankhead at a Toronto gay club. It was the beginning of a career that crossed over to general audiences and international acclaim. And I was a little perplexed because he had little or no makeup on. Uh, he then proceeded to put on the cheapest Dynell wig I've ever seen, but I think he bought at a Woolworth bargain counter, and artfully draped a sheet around him to suggest a gown, but he went out on stage, opened his mouth and said something like, oh, darling, they all went slack-jawed. And he could have heard a flea fart. It was so quiet. And then he proceeded, and the next thing we heard was this volcanic roar. It really clicked. I liked it. I liked the applause. I liked being somebody else. And they dug it. So I took the next year and unveiled a different character every month. I got really involved with doing these shows, of the 511, Manatee, the August Club, La Trick, anywhere I could pick up 15 bucks. From there, I never stopped. I went with him on his tours. So, I mean, I, I was quite aware of what was going on. I was, I was, uh, and, and when, you know, I didn't want to lose him. That's about it, and I know, and from what I learned with, with meeting the other boys, um, not only his friends, but other ones at the shows, um, that how much desperately they needed somebody, that they, they wanted, 
they just wanted. I mean, they, they thought I was wonderful because I would go and see them. And I was appearing at the Gaiety Lounge of the Iroquois Hotel in Galt. And they come in from Hollywood and see the show. Okay, you want to come to Hollywood? Great. Who's going to say no? I was on the next plane. Uh, I said, Craig, I said, I don't think that's the place for you to go. I don't think there's any future, real future in it for you. And he said, Mom, he said, give me five years. I told my mom in 72, full of beans and everything else, I said, I'm going to be a movie star in five years. And she said, sure, dear, I hope so. 77. Came outrageous. A director in town, he said, you should read this script and meet this guy. And why is that? It was about a hairdresser who has a nutty girlfriend and he doesn't want to be a hairdresser anymore. And he wants to be Marilyn Monroe and uh, all the others, uh, Carol Channing. And uh, he goes to New York and uh, does his act and people like him and he, she's crazy and they have a great time. This is 1977, you know. Uh, Beachcombers was about as far out as things were getting in those days. We no longer think 120 artistic ways to photograph a beaver is enough to, uh, to make a feature film. Oh, well, let's just uh, see what makes it in Toronto. Uh, oh, here's Andy and his Bavarian accordion at the Sheraton. Maybe you'll get sick. Oh, and here's Anne Murray coming to the gardens. Maybe we'll get sick. Look, the straight clubs in this town just aren't ready. Besides, no Canadian act makes it here without the U.S. seal of approval. I liked it to a certain extent. I, I personally thought it was shot badly. I mean, it kept cutting out people's heads and things. But um, I thought, he, well, he was good in it. I liked it all. I thought, I thought, I thought it was a good story. And, and you come out, I came out feeling good. I mean, and the music stayed with you. This was what I liked about it. Uh, that, that you came out singing, it ain't easy. And it wasn't. It ain't easy in this crazy world. I could never make it without you. Feeling so gay. Propelled to stardom when Life and Times returns. First thing that impressed me about Craig Russell, the reason I stayed with him for so many years, and the thing that I remember most about him was that he was a fantastic musician. Craig could and would, when he was in character, uh, be able to emulate on a very, very high level the expertise that they brought to their singing. When he would do Ella Fitzgerald, for example, we would do a jazz thing and he would do some scat singing. And he would scat sing really excellently. Didn't do it as good as Ella Fitzgerald, but he did it very well. He did it better than most other jazz singers could do it. wonderful people. We met Carol Channing, Liberace, Peggy V. Romeo loved Juliet, Juliet she felt the same. When he put his arms around her, he said, Julie, baby, you are my flame. 
they'll do fever. When you kiss me, fever, when you... My pills are working. Fever. I'm a fire. I love you. Save your hand. You might need it later. <laughs> he had become a, an instant celebrity. Everyone knew of him. And the offers were pouring in, pouring in, and um, his career just took off. Where did we go? Where didn't we go? We went everywhere. We went all to the great concert halls in uh, Australia, in Berlin, in Los Angeles, Carnegie Hall in New York, San Francisco, Chicago, all over the place. It was really, he really became an international uh, celebrity. He was, he won the um, Berlin Film Festival. And um, that was truly a, a blast. Actually, the, the film, that's the reason we're here, that. And of course, for your festival, your wonderful festival here in the Federal Republic. And uh, I'm very grateful to represent Canada in this uh, festival. And thank you. I love you. I do. of outrageous and world concert tours propelled Craig Russell to international stardom. He appeared impersonating his ladies on The Love Boat and Trapper John, M.D. He did countless talk shows in Europe, Australia, Canada, and the United States, and made cameo appearances in feature films. He's the star of Outrageous, and he's her co-star, and the only person ever to win an award for best performance by an actor and an actress. For the same role in the same film, you had to be there. Hollis McLaren and Craig Russell. Uh, my favorite actor was Joan Crawford. Well, you know what Joan Crawford would do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She would give you the shoulders, the full attitude, and say... <laughs> How dare you! <laughs> what a woman! It's the rare art of female impersonation, and we have the best practitioner of this art with us. And when I say art, you'll know exactly what I mean. Ladies and gentlemen, watch the artistry of... Mr. Craig Russell. Nancy, get the bagel out of your shop. Give me a close-up on David. You're a big one, Craig. Uh, you know Professor Keller. Oh, Professor Keller. You're no relation to Helen, are you? <laughs> she choreographed my act. <laughs> Look, sir. One of the high points in his career was when he was booked into Carnegie Hall for the first time. And he was very excited, and um, it was a, an honor to appear on the same stage that a lot of these ladies had appeared. And it was very sentimental time for him. He truly was brilliant that evening. It was like a rock band in many ways, uh, or a rock band show. Uh, there were the groupies, there was the hype, there were the limousines, there were the sort of expensive hotels, the champagne being sent up. Um, Craig was not one who particularly liked to eat in restaurants, so the food was always sent up. If you're playing, he, at that point he was playing Carnegie Hall. He said to me, if you're playing Carnegie Hall and you're making $10,000, you've got to spend 20000 to make them think you're making thirty. The favorite show I ever played with Craig Russell, I think, was in uh, Amsterdam, Holland. The audience is there were generally less outrageous than some of the audiences you'd get in North America. They were uh, the serious theater crowd that were appreciating Craig as, a, as an actor and as a, as a performer, both in the United States and Europe, but especially in Europe, uh, I get some really, really top-notch jazz musicians in the orchestra. And of course, that would turn Craig on, it turned me on, and, and uh, just have a terrific show. The once lovely recording artist, Anita Bryant Green. <laughs> Queers. 
You must read Leviticus, for it is written, brethren and sistren, there is hope for all who have gone astray. Hey, hey, cabaret. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Everybody! I know how you feel. I feel the same way. I feel like Judy Garland. There's not much left to my life but my career. I hardly even see the days anymore, and there is just enough time to have a drink and a salute to Judy on the other side of that rainbow. And then it is off to rehearsals and more rehearsals. I've played Carnegie Hall four times in my life twice with the rock band I was in my house, and twice with Craig Russell. And the second time with Craig Russell was probably the worst professional experience I've ever had. So it's an hour before showtime, and I go to the dressing room in Carnegie Hall, and I look at Craig and his, uh, Paul Raymond, his makeup guy, is there, and I look at Craig, and I look at Paul Raymond, and Craig is Judy Garland in the dying phases. The band comes, we play the first opening thing. Ladies and gentlemen, Craig Russell. I guess uh, he must have been pretty stoned. And he came out and basically crawled under the grand piano and stayed there the entire night. I mean, he was Judy, he was uh, Ben Davis, he was Carol Channing, he was everybody under the piano. And Craig never got up through the show. He did the whole show on the, on the ground, on the stage at Carnegie Hall, doing all songs, that none of which were uh, in the band's music, uh, basically not very well. And when it came um, time for intermission, like we were trying to sneak out, people were asking for their money back, it was a real tragedy. And I felt personally betrayed on a professional level. Craig Russell, the subject of making it, had made it. But the Carnegie Hall disaster was an omen of intolerable performance pressures and increasing substance abuse. There he was standing there with his Judy Garland costume on, his Mae West wig on crooked, uh, his makeup peeling off his face, these dark glasses on and like, looked like, you know, Cruella de Vil almost, lipstick just sort of dripping. And he, had, he still, and he still had, had his high heels on, but he had this big bag of cocaine and these long red fingernails, and he just dipped his finger in and went like this <laughs> to me. <laughs> Somebody, a reporter, asked him, uh, are you uh, basically a happy person? And Craig's reply was, what do you expect from a gay transsexual? Happiness? He said, I'm miserable half the time. He said, I put on an act. Under stress, Craig reverted to his concept of normal values. Mae West had offered him a feeling of permanence. Hairdressing had offered him some sense of security. His ladies had provided a persona for Craig Russell. Now Russell Craig Eady once again tried to go straight. I was broke. I had no, uh, no place to stay. Uh, friends, no friends. And there was one girl who... Uh, took what little money she had and rented a place and said, you can stay here. I was so grateful that what can I do? 
for her to show her how important this is to me. And as any girl, most girls could tell you, they'd like to be married. <laughs> I've been fooling around with boys long enough. It's time to get married to a woman. The Life and Times of Craig Russell will continue. He had proposed to Margaret, so we knew there was a proposal in there. Well, he'd asked me to marry him the day before he asked Lori to marry him, and I said no because I, I didn't understand this person that was uh, raging in front of me. And I was I jealous? No, is that your, No, I wasn't jealous of Lori. Uh, I was afraid for Craig. I was afraid of him. I. I was afraid of the amounts of cocaine he was taking. I was afraid of the huge amounts of booze he was taking. I think something had happened terrible inside him, terrible inside him. He'd been used up completely. I wasn't surprised when Craig showed up, you know, for the wedding dressed in a tuxedo and ruby red high heels, because he claimed that we're not in Kansas anymore, are we? <laughs> like that. It was pretty good fun. And yeah. uh, when we got into the, the band, was the, the minister, Craig immediately pointed out to him that he wasn't the bride. So I, I had met her, and I told her that day, I said, Laurie, you know what you're getting into? I said, do you know what you're getting into? Oh, yeah, she was sure of it. I said, you know, I said, it's not going to be a lot, an easy life. Laurie was determined to make it last. She was just a devoted Idol fan, and she would be true to him or follow him wherever he went, I'm sure. No, I thought it would last. We had a real marriage. Yeah, it was, uh, it was, I think he saw in me, my adoration for him is what he felt towards Mae West. I think Greg, Craig's biggest problem was that he could never decide who he wanted to be. And that was the reason that he'd get on a phone and change characters as he went along, because each, each of those characters would have their own impression of what was going on in the world. So you had to say, I want to talk to Craig. Judy, get off the phone, put Craig on, you know. Sometimes the characters did, well, a lot of the times, the characters did take him over. And so he actually became these people. And uh, sometimes these people were difficult because he became them and lost himself. Craig's last major concert, called The Incident by Friends, was at Vancouver's prestigious Queen Elizabeth Theatre, the launch of a comeback six-week international tour. One hour before the concert, makeup artist Paul Raymond was summoned to the hotel by Craig. I rushed back to the hotel, went into the suite, and there was Craig in the bathtub. He was under the water, he had shaved all his hair off, and he suddenly emerged from the water saying, Hi there, I'm Esther Williams, with all the hair stuck to his chest. I knew we were in trouble. I knew we were in trouble then. <laughs> I think it just gradually built up, unfortunately, and exploded. Running onto the stage, he took his wardrobe with him and started throwing the wardrobe into the audience and uh, the, the uh, musical arranger's uh, notes that he was not familiar with. He picked them all up and threw those into the audience. The whole show was an impromptu show that never got off the ground. It was a disaster. People started leaving the theater. Um, he started screaming at the audience. The, the line became very blurred because for years I was uh, living in the look. So I became these ladies. I became, for all intent and purposes, a hard-working woman. I was the most uh, destructive and the, the, the demons that were starting to come out in me and, and trashing my... <laughs> The terrible, terrible things. To witness the disintegration 
of not only of Craig, but of his career. People left the theater booing, and he was left alone on the stage. When I did have time off where I could go to the cottage and forget Craig Russell for a while, who wanted to know Craig Eady? It was just, who are you? It's this, my own mother said, you know, when he's not doing his characters, he's nothing. That really made me think. Now performer non grata in North America, Craig ran to Germany, where he felt he was still adored. We let him go. Without, you know, and he, and he went over there, and we never heard very much about what happened in Germany. Uh, I said, when will I see you again? And he said, oh, in a couple of months. I said, oh, okay. I could handle, hand, handle that. And uh, so I thought it would be okay, a couple of months. But uh, it turned into quite a lot longer, quite a bit longer than that. We didn't hear from her for about five years. I lived as a Turkish Frau for two weeks cleaning apartments. Mm -hmm. And it was great. I didn't even have to shave. I yeah. just I just wore a bandana and pushed a baby carriage. And they looked in the carriage and they said, my God, your daughter's hairier than you are. Yeah. You know, and I said, no, that's Joan Collins in divorce court. <laughs> he was just paying to feed the dogs and afford another bottle of booze. I think he didn't care. He didn't, I, I can't say. He wasn't suicidal. Um, he was just letting it happen. He just wanted desperately some physical and tender attention and affection and, and love. Craig returned to Canada to star in Too Outrageous, a sequel 10 years after his first film. He hated the script, but still came back. Couldn't say no. I wanted to come home so badly. I'm glad I did. What's a movie? It's, it's over in an hour or two anyway. Mm -hmm. He was alcohol soaked. And yet he was sober enough in his uh, intellectual mind to realize that he was returning to what he envisioned and hoped would be a return to his former glory with outrageous. Have you seen 1,200 people sitting in the Ryerson Theatre go, <sighs> you know, that was halfway through it. But anyway, what a shame. But you get a hit, you get a flop. <laughs> yeah. There was never anything really sad about Craig because he had such a, a dominant spirit it's like if a warrior gets killed, uh, is it sad? No, it's, 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 it's celebratory even in defeat, you know. The last time I saw him, he was uh, in a restaurant with what looked like uh, an entourage you wouldn't really want to be with. There were two or three kind of very seedy looking uh, characters and he looked down on his luck and morose and uh, seemed extremely unhappy. Well, by that time he had quite a lot, quite a lot to be unhappy about. After that movie was three years of nothingness. Because I, I, I started feeling sick. I couldn't do the show. I, I begged uh, this Gino Empery to book me in Kappa Skasing or Timmins or someplace where I could have fun. He booked me into the Imperial Room again. And I was in no condition. And no voice. And just, oh. Awful. He was really gross. It was filthy. Sexually filthy words. I mean, it was gross so yeah that's 
that's the uh, that was basically the the end of the I thought of Craig Russell. I went back to my own name and just went on welfare and stayed in the basement. The one time I did see him on, well after his career went down the hills in Port Perry when he did a like a hometown concert there where he grew up, he was on. So I suggested to him that uh, as, the, as the involved in the community and as the mayor, that it would be a good idea if he came to Port Perry, did a, did a, a benefit show for the old town hall because Craig, when he was a, a young lad in Port Perry, uh, had some music recitals in the, in the old town hall. We were excited, but I think he was more nervous for that one than he was for many of them because he's coming back to his hometown and how was he going to be received and it was, you know, and it was kind of, he was starting back in and he wanted it to be a, a good show and, and he was helping the town, which, which as a youngster he was here quite often. And I sort of laid the law down, there'd be no, no drinking prior to the show and, and he, uh, he respected the fact that I didn't want any trouble in Port Perry and, and he didn't, he didn't, didn't touch a thing, no drinking, no nothing, so that's why the show in Port Perry was so good. And he stayed here with me the whole summer. Now that was the first time in a long time that we'd had time together alone. And so we had a lot of talks. And he told me at that point that he was HIV positive. That same day he told me, I was floored, absolutely floored. I had no idea. It would mean a great deal to me if I thought he didn't know he had AIDS that afternoon. It would mean a great deal of difference to me. But our clothes were off and he was just about to enter me when the doorbell rang. I mean that literally, literally. Um, I didn't know Craig had AIDS until he died. This uh, AIDS thing, I knew something was wrong with me in 1980. Yep, I was already having internal uh, problems and things that couldn't be pinpointed to drinking too much or other things. And I told friends in California, I said, I've got some kind of cancer. I don't know what it is. The Other Side of the Rainbow, when life and times returns. Well, oh, you know, when you just had enough and but it, it, the problem was I was comparing myself with the old me. I wanted to be Craig Russell all the time. Sometimes forgetting this was a little monster I created, this, this Craig Russell, you know? It's, nobody named Craig Russell. It's a culmination of my dreams, my ideas, all the things I thought would be a fabulous show, a fabulous star. So I put it together, which means I can also put it back in the bag and uh, lock the trunk. Russell Craig Eady died on Halloween 1990 of an AIDS-related stroke. He was cremated and buried in Port Perry, Ontario. I don't want to die an old fag alone without lovers, without a certain amount of respect. I want to say, I made it once. Me, I made it. I am tired of being always less than good in the world's eyes. So tired. I should have another drink and a salute to Judy on the other side of that rainbow. My final salute for this long day. I know that sometimes it seems you'll never find the rainbow, but we all will in our own time and in our own way. Fly beyond.